I'm John Stansfield. I was a co-pilot on uh, 15 Squadron and it was my first tour after getting my wings and uh, we were based at RAF Cottesmore but on this particular occasion for this particular flight we were out in uh, Malaya, in Malaysia at uh, RAAF Butterworth on detachment. We were part of Exercise Chamfron which was the RAF response or the British government response to the confrontation of uh, the formation of Malaysia by uh, Indonesia. So we were out there sort of showing the flag, making sure that the Indonesians know or knew that uh, if they did start anything, then the uh, RAF was available to respond. On this particular flight from RAF uh, Butterworth, we were taking off on a normal day, a normal training flight, which would uh, normally be approximately four and a half hours. We'd get our bell and turn right over the sea, climb out over the Malacca Straits up to a cruising height uh, over 40,000 feet. Fly for about um, four hours of navigation exercise and then we'd uh, come back uh, to deliver our uh, practice bombs on a bomb site known as uh, Song Song, which really was just a, a raft of um, oil drums all tied together and painted red in the uh, sea off the coast and our normal position would be a visual bombing sortie with our uh, nav plotter and this particular occasion was a chap called Peter uh, Chapman he would come down the, from his seat in the middle at the back of the three seats at the back he would come down into the visual bombing position and he would steer the aircraft onto the target and we would drop these practice bombs and there are two positions on the ground that would record the splashes and they eventually would tell us how far we missed the target by. Uh, looking ahead there was a, a cloud developing and uh, it was right on track and our plotter really didn't like us going off track too often it would upset his plot so we just had steaming on climbing through the cloud when suddenly without any warning there was an enormous bang and immediately I could look down and see that the three and four engine throttles had suddenly snapped back like that. I looked across at Ken, Ken McLean who was flying the aeroplane and his hands were still on the um, controls so he hadn't touched the throttles I looked up at the fire buttons which are here and uh, the three and four fire bottles uh, lights hadn't illuminated which we thought well they possibly they could have done but they didn't and then I looked down at the engine instruments and number three engine was actually stationary and number four was winding down and obviously we'd had some catastrophic failure so Ken turned the aircraft away from the cloud out into the open and uh, I went to uh, did the closing down checks for those two engines turning off all the fuel to that uh, particular wing and carrying out the engine uh, shutdown checks and immediately after that we uh, called uh, Butterworth on their radio frequency to say we're doing an immediate return back to the airfield uh, having had a major uh, engine failure and we requested a priority landing which was of course cleared. Now at this point we had only been airborne for about 20 minutes less so we were full of fuel we were really overweight and on a big aeroplane like this you normally have a maximum weight for landing the aircraft but we were well above that. But rather than just mess about with our two good engines uh, burning fuel away, we had no means of dumping the fuel, uh, we decided to land because we just didn't know what structural damage we'd incurred in the explosion. We could have possibly uh, weakened the wing and at any time it could have uh, broken. So we wanted to get down as quickly as we could. So we called air traffic to that point that we needed a priority landing, we needed all the emergency vehicles available to us on landing and we then made a long straight in approach with Ken doing the flying 
and me just operating the fuel and uh, making sure everything else was uh, fine. We'd obviously warned the, the rear crew members that uh, that's what we were going to do, so they were all uh, set up ready. Now the approach when you're so heavy is a thing that we'd never done before because you would never approach above your normal uh, maximum landing weight. But I looked in our uh, cards to determine what our approach speeds would be. So we set those up and we fly those speeds well above our normal approach speeds. Now the runway at um, RWF Butterworth was shorter than the one at uh, our base. Uh, which was Cottesmore, uh, but we would obviously coped with that with uh, normal circumstances but this was a little bit abnormal, in fact a lot abnormal. So we're thinking well we're going to land on a shortish runway, we're going to have virtually no help from the wind because it was still in the morning, very light winds were blowing, but the temperatures being so close to the equator were well up into the 30s, so nothing helped us. Kane was flying the approach, put the gear down, and put the flap down. In that situation, once you've got gear down and flap down, with only got two engines left, it's very rare that you would have to go around in that situation to our weight. So it was a one-off approach. We had to get it right. And came did get it right, came in over the threshold at the right speed. Uh, but uh, on touchdown, uh, on a normal sortie, the first thing you would do and touch down, you would uh, operate the parachute. We have a brake parachute which is over here uh, in the corner, operated by the captain. Uh, unfortunately, on this occasion, the speed was so high that uh, we uh, exceeded by only a, a knot or two the maximum speed that you could flare the parachute. I think at the time it was about 160 knots. So that's a very high approach speed. We would never normally uh, be th at that speed. But that uh, weak link in the parachute system was uh, just as a safety precaution if the parachute ever deployed whilst you were at height or in some other embarrassing situation. But on this occasion we flared the parachute, it gave us an initial pull, uh, but then the weak link snapped. So there we are, we're on the runway with no parachute and we're having to rely only on our tow brakes. Now the tow brakes are on the end of the rudder bars and I looked across at Ken uh, who wasn't a very tall chap uh, and his body was straight out. He was pressing on his tow brakes as hard as he possibly could and the aircraft is fitted with a device on all its wheels apart from the nose wheel uh, called Maxaret. And what they do, a little bit like an anti-lock braking system on a car, uh, they brake as maximum that they can before the wheels start locking. So the Maxarets were doing their job, braking the aircraft as the maximum, but even then I could not resist it. I had to apply and help uh, Ken by sticking my feet on the rudder bars and pressing as hard as I could because I could look ahead and I could see the end of the runway coming up. There was the overrun on the runway is just soft ground, possibly even swamp, with tree with uh, palm trees ahead of us. And as the runway was flashing by, we'd never landed at these sort of speeds before. Pressing as hard as we both of us could press on the brakes, we slowly, very slowly, slowed down and came to a halt with just a few yards to go. All the fire trucks and the ambulances all poured around us and the door was flung open and we shut the engines down and, and did all the things, turned the master switch off and got out of the aircraft as quickly as we could. We got out of the aircraft and were taken back to the mess and enjoyed a very cool cold beer for we'd had a, a quite an experience. Then next day we went back to the aircraft and there it was, all forlorn, in, now having been towed off the runway back to the ramp and uh, could see that the number three engine was absolutely blown apart. The um, nacelle underneath was all blown off. We could look directly at the compressor, all the blades missing and even looking down the inlet we could see number four engine was badly damaged as well with even bits of number three engine uh, impaled in it. 
Later on, when uh, the fault was diagnosed, we were told that what we'd had was a centerline closure. And a centerline closure is when you fly through really cold, very wet air, as in the case in this cloud that we went through, and the outer casing of the aircraft shrinks because it uh, is impinged with all this cold water. It shrinks to a point where the inner part of the engine, the compressor, wells itself onto it. And that means it rips off all the uh, blades. And um, so obviously the engine seizes. And in our case, because of the, the staggering of the two engines, the number three engine ahead of the number four engine, the bits were blown forward and then sucked into number four. And that's what destroyed number three engine as, uh, number four engine as well. Uh, that was the first time a Victor had ever suffered a centerline closure and obviously we knew in the future what not to do. I don't know what happened to the aircraft eventually. It took something like a year to repair it for it to be flown back to the UK to be either scrapped or converted to a tanker. But by that time our squadron had disbanded. I personally had been uh, sent to uh, Little Risington to learn how to be a flying instructor and my next posting was uh, subsequently as a flying instructor at a flying school.